Well, thank you everyone and welcome to the Microsoft DevOps user group. Um, this is our second monthly meeting. Really excited to have kicked this uh, new user group off last year. It's been a really, really needed community and industry venue in the Microsoft space. Um, I think for some time the, the AustinSpace.net community is really vibrant, but the DevOps space has been has been uh, you know, dominated by some other technology. So I'm really excited to kick this off for the Microsoft segment of the industry. And not just in Austin, but Austin has the headquarters for live streaming uh, this information for wherever people are listening around the globe. So um, the Microsoft DevOps user group um, has uh, a, few, a few elements that are, are bedrocks. First of all, we exist to promote, educate, and adopt DevOps practices for Microsoft platform custom software. Um, it's always going to be free, no dues, no fees, and that is because this group is sponsor supported. For any, any expenses or resources that the user group needs, we solicit various sponsors who, uh, who find it advantageous to participate in, in the DevOps community, and so uh, we function that way. Um, before we get to our presenter, which we're really excited to have, uh, Brian Harry from Microsoft. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors, and uh, we have two sponsors this month. Uh, the first sponsor, who is our location sponsor, um, is Clear Measure, but our monthly sponsor is Q2 e Banking, and um, Sarah has some information about them. All right, and so uh, we'll get we'll get into our uh, into our presentation about DevOps at Microsoft. And so Brian Harry is our presenter, and he is the corporate vice president of the Visual Studio Team Services organization. He's responsible for the Visual Studio Team Services and TFS product lines. Uh, VSTS and TFS are a team collaboration product designed to dramatically improve the productivity, predictability, and agility of software development teams by ensuring that all team members have easy access to the information they need to make the right decisions at the right time. Um, Harry worked at a startup at DaVinci Systems doing electronic mail software from 88 to 92, um, and then he left DaVinci with two others to create OneTree Software. Um, it was a garage-type startup company that developed that uh, developed and sold SourceSafe, Visual SourceSafe, um, that Microsoft now owns. And then it was acquired by Microsoft in 94. After joining Microsoft, Harry worked in what was then the Tools and Database Division. And for a couple of years, he worked on SourceSafe and then on Microsoft Repository. In 96, he and others began working on the problem of improving the approachability of uh, APIs for the developer masses. And Although this started as an investigation of ways to extend COM, it eventually grew into what we now know as the .NET framework. Uh, Harry has served as the development manager for the Common Language Runtime, CLR, and then as the um, product unit manager through the rest of V1 and most of the, the V1.1 product cycle. And he's also previously owned the Application Insights and Kusto product lines. So I want to Thank Brian for presenting uh, how Microsoft DevOps journey has gone and want to give him a warm welcome. Thank, Thank you, Brian, you very much. Yours. All right, I appreciate it. All right, let me work on the sharing. There we go. Screen share. And I need to flip again, don't I? Yes. Come on, go away. There we go. Settings. Swap. Bingo. Good? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. All right. It was great to talk to you guys. Um, so he, he read far too long of an intro uh, to me, so I won't, I won't do a lot more on that. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about DevOps at Microsoft. Um, it's a really big topic, um, 
you know, I, I, we recently, back in October, did a, um, uh, did a, a, a train the trainer uh, exercise where we brought in a couple hundred DevOps professionals to train them on sort of the Microsoft DevOps style. And it's a three day experience. So I'm going to try to compress three days into an hour. Uh, and I'm going to do that by being very selective about a, a subset of topics to talk about. But it's, it's a rich, rich area with a lot of stuff. So a, a little bit of background. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about it mostly from the context in which I have participated. Um, I kind of have two roles. One, I'm responsible for Team Foundation Server, Server and Visual Studio Team Services. It's a product that helps customers uh, with DevOps. We operate it as a cloud service. Um, I'm also responsible for what we call 1ES, the first party engineering system in Microsoft. So all of the engineering system tools that uh, Windows uses, that Office uses, Bing, Azure, uh, I'm responsible for. And as it turns out, most of them are based on Visual Studio Team Services, so that works out really well. Um, so, uh, but as I, as I sort of tell you stories and talk about the context here, I'm mostly gonna talk about this in the context of Visual Studio Team Services. Uh, it's, a, it's a scoped enough problem to talk about. Um, so to, to just put a little perspective on it, um, a, a DevOps journey sort of moving from what I'd call classic traditional waterfall software development to a modern cloud cadence uh, development process is a long journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Here's a little bit of timeline um, for us. We started our journey when, when sort of think about our DevOps journey. We started in August 2010. Um, with the adoption of, uh, of Scrum as our project management methodology. Um, Sprint 1 was August 2010, and uh, the slide obviously is now a couple months out of date. Um, November 2017 was Sprint 127. We're now finishing Sprint 129. Um, and many, many things have changed along the way. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a handful of them that I think are, are particularly interesting. One other thing to know is we really ship two products out of one code base. Um, we ship Visual Studio Team Services, which is our cloud-based product. And we also ship uh, Team Foundation Server, which is an on-premises product. Um, Visual Studio Team Services, the cloud-based product, ships, ships every three weeks. And by that, I mean, we roll up, we, we do three-week sprints, and at the end of every three week sprint, we ship all of the work to the cloud. Um, we actually deploy every day, literally every day, sometimes many times a day. There's daily deployments, there's hot fix deployments, there's stuff always happening. But when we talk about a three week cadence, what that means is all of our new feature work is rolling out every three weeks. And then uh, our team foundation server, our on premises product, we we sort of sprint, 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 deploy, deploy, deploy to the cloud. And then about once every three to five months, we roll all that up and we ship it in an on-premises product. So we've had to develop kind of a DevOps process that accommodates both cadences, that very, very rapid daily deployment to cloud, along with a, a slower um, uh, deployment cadence for uh, mission critical on-premises servers. All right. So let's talk about some of the key things that we've done, sort of key realizations that we've had and, um, and uh, processes and practices that we've put in place. So the, the first, one of the first things you quickly realize when you wanna move from, uh, from a very sort of more waterfall, slower pace to a, a cloud cadence of shipping constantly shipping main all the time is, you know, you're going to ship half finished stuff. Um, if you're going to deploy very frequently, you're either going to end up with a ton of branches or you're going to ship stuff that's not done. Um, and I could tell you from experience, ton of branches is a bad idea. So we moved to a model of everything's in master. We ship master regularly and master's always at shipping quality, though the code that's in master may not be done. It could be half-baked. And so what do you do if you're shipping half-baked code, shipping code that's not finished? Um, what that means is you've gotta be able to control what people see. You gotta be able to have code in there that even though it's in there and you're working on it, 
doesn't have any impact on the user experience until you're ready for users to see it. So we call that controlling exposure. And the mechanism of controlling exposure is called feature flags. Feature flags allow you to have um, a, a switch that, ter that dynamically changes the code path. So you can have a bunch of code in there that has no effect, throw a feature flag and the code path switches and starts executing that, uh, that code path. Um, so what does it give you? It gives you the ability to decouple deployment from exposure. I can deploy, 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 then decide to expose at a later time. Um, the, the feature flags give me very fine grain control. I can, uh, you know, in different apps, it's gonna, granularity is gonna be different, but I can control feature flags per user. So that user sees the feature flag on, that user sees the feature flag off. Um, I can control it by account, so sort of entire teams can see uh, a feature flag on or off. Um, it, it gives me very fine-grained ability to control who sees things, and we use that in very creative ways. Um, first, uh, as you'd expect, um, when we're building the code, we very early turn on the feature flag so we can see the code. So it's, it's deployed to production, it's constantly moving. Um, and we turn the feature flags on, we're able to test it, we're able to evolve it, use it, get our own feedback, realize, oh, that's not the way I like it, we need to change it. And then when it's finally in a good state, we turn it on to the next set of customers, which is sort of, you could think of as beta testers, um, who are early adopters who wanna be able to see it, give us feedback. Then when we get good feedback from that, we've incorporated, it might take a couple of sprints, um, we will uh, expose it to the broader world. We've also used feature flags um, to give people control of their own experience. So if we're gonna make a big change um, to the UX, like when we, we've now a couple of times redone our navigation on our website, it's kind of jarring. You know, everything's now in a different place. Um, we've actually enabled uh, the end user to have control over the feature flag. So, Initially, it will be available as a preview feature, which, uh, which you can discover and opt into if you'd like to try it out. Um, when we've gotten some good feedback and we feel good about it, um, we will uh, turn it on by default, but give you the ability to turn the feature flag off. So, you know, we, we turned it on, you looked at you, oh man, that's, that's overwhelming, that's confusing, I don't understand it, let me turn it off. Um, we'll then ask you for feedback. Why did you turn it off? What, what was the problem? Um, we'll then go through an iteration cycle on that. And then ultimately, uh, once we feel good about it, nobody's turning it off anymore, we've addressed all the feedback, um, we'll completely take away the ability to turn it off. Now it's just the way the product is. It's no longer a feature flag. So this allows us to iterate and evolve on experiences over many, many deployments of the product. Um, you can you make this change without redeployment. So a feature flag can be configured via the web UI. It can be rolled out as a config change through the deployment process. Um, as I said, it enables us to support early feedback and experimentation. It also, in the event of you know you deployed something and uh, and things went bad, the feature doesn't work. Um, you could very quickly turn it off by turning off the feature flag and uh, and get rid of the buggy experience until you can go fix it. And you know that's that happens often. You know I, I'd say at least once every couple sprints, there's some feature which we plan to deploy and we put it out there and realize, ooh, that is not as good as we thought it was going to be, and uh, and we just turn the feature flag back off. All right, so just an example. So this is our, uh, our Git pull request experience. And there was a time when we didn't have the revert button. Uh, that was a new experience that we wanted to add. So um, in a, feature, uh, a feature flag is defined by some sec XML declarative. This is the definition of a feature flag. That was, this was called the source control dot revert feature flag. And in the code, um, uh, you, this is JavaScript, of course. Uh, you just read the state of the feature flag and then mutate the DOM based on, uh, on that. If the feature flag is off, don't include the button. If the feature flag is on, do include the button. Um, and that gives you sort of all of that power. If the button's hidden, the feature's gone. No one can see it. No one can exercise the code behind it. The button's there. People can see it and use it. 
All right, so that's one super important uh, mechanism that I'd say any modern DevOps uh, practice needs to have uh, at play. Let's talk about the, another one. Um, that's all well and good. You can, you can turn stuff on, you can turn stuff off, but fundamentally, um, a lot of that is human speed, right? Oh, there's a problem, let me go turn off the feature flag. Well, that, it, it could take minutes or hours or, or longer sometimes for humans to react and diagnose and figure out what to do. You'd really like a system to be resilient, to be sort of self, uh, self-mitigating. Um, so as we sort of progressed through our journey, we went through a phase of, of reliability problems and, uh, and really trying to figure out how we were gonna, as, as the system's sort of constantly changing, how we were gonna make the system reliable, highly available, um, and, uh, and sort of self-maintaining and not uh, deluging us in, in uh, sort of management work. So if we, if we can't prevent failure, and you can't, you, you, there's no way to make failure never happen, uh, you know, to, to sort of state that in an obvious way. Does anybody believe they can ship a meaningful product without a single bug? Uh, if anybody raised their hand and said, yes, you're a liar, because um, you just can't. Um, so if you can't prevent it, are there things you can do to limit it, to mitigate it quickly, to resolve it quickly? How do you think about that problem? Um, so another example. Um, so we released a feature back in uh, 2013 to synchronize uh, Visual Studio settings across your, your computers. So you could configure Visual Studio on one machine and then you could go to another machine and your settings would roam and your Visual Studio would behave the same way. And this was done um, uh, via uh, notifications from a, a service that we have called SPS, Shared Platform Services. And we turned that capability on, and uh, within almost instantly, um, we shot up to 500 million requests per second, or sorry, per minute, per minute, on the, creating the subscription notification. And it, it overwhelmed the system. So you can see here, this is a graph of requests per minute. Um, we turned the feature flag on. There was a little bit of testing noise in the beginning, and then boom, when it went live for the world, it uh, it just went crazy. And then afterwards, you're seeing our successive attempts to mitigate it and eventually fix the problem. But the result is, it took a while uh, for us to fix that problem. And in the meantime, um, it, it, the system was unhealthy. Well, what's bad about it being unhealthy, oh, let's cover this first. So what happened? VS requests notifications from SPS. Um, SPS creates a subscription and service bus. Uh, the call was normally fast, but because of some changes, it became slow. Um, each call executed in an SPS on another thread, on, on a thread. So you get 500 million requests per minute, and guess what? The thread pool was exhausted. Basically, there were no threads available to do anything else. So all the requests start queuing. Well, what's the problem? The problem is SPS wasn't just a microservice for, for sharing um, uh, Visual Studio notifications. That service performed a bunch of things, including user authentication and, uh, and, and had all the account metadata in it. So this one request, because of a new rolled out feature in, uh, to synchronize VS settings, caused our entire service to go down because nobody could authenticate anymore. So you couldn't access your code, you couldn't access your work items, you couldn't run builds, you couldn't do anything, all because this one notification to notify a new feature to synchronize VS settings overloaded the server. Um, so we spent a while debugging it, oh, and, and retries of course made it worse because the get all these millions of VS clients out there failing to subscribe and retrying, uh, which when the problem is an overloaded system and thread, thread exhaustion only creates more requests and more thread exhaustion. So it was this downward spiral. So as I say, that created a cascading failure where a 
a, a new, what I would call relatively low priority feature, consumed a limited resource that, uh, that blocked the critical functions in the rest of the service and caused a service-wide outage. And uh, yeah, retries made the problem worse. Um, so what, you know, what, what do we need to do? We need to figure out how to limit the impact of this kind of problem. We have to degrade gracefully. Um, and once the problem is resolved, the service needs to be able to recover uh, quickly. Um, for in this case, what we did is we humans looked at it, figured out what was happening, and ultimately turned off the feature flag. But again, that takes hours uh, of getting somebody's attention, getting them online, getting them to start debugging it, getting them to figure out you know, what's happening, turn off the feature flag, check and make sure that that actually did it, um, takes time. So how can the system do that, detect it's unhealthy, and, uh, and fail much faster? So there's a, a pattern called circuit breakers, which was originally uh, developed at Netflix and now is in relatively wide use uh, in the industry, certainly in mission critical services. That is designed to stop, ca stop cascading failures in a distributed system, it's to basically isolate failure and make sure that failure in one thing doesn't yield, doesn't lead to failure in lots of other things. Um, it gives you protection against latency, errors, and, and volume problems. It does this by shedding load quickly, that whenever there's a, a part of the system that starts to fail, starts to back up, you shed load in that part of the system very quickly, and the rest of the system falls back and gracefully deals with uh, the unavailability of, uh, of one part of the system. Here's, here's how circuit breakers work. They are, they are essentially uh, gates between two parts of the system. When that gate is closed, is, is uh, connected, then every call just passes through. You count every successful and you count every failure. When the number of failures, and that could be number of calls that don't return, number of calls that are too slow, number of calls that yield exceptions, when that failure count gets to a certain percentage, exceeds some threshold, and you define what the threshold is, the circuit breaker trips. And what that means is that call is now gonna start failing immediately. Rather than, uh, than blocking or taking a lot of compute time or consuming a thread for a long time, it's just gonna immediately fail and return. And it's gonna do that for some period of time, which is long enough for the system to kind of self, self clear. And if uh, at, at, at the end of that timeout time, it's going to enter what's called the half open state, um, where it's ready to try to reset itself, but it's got to watch um, the calls for a little while and it's going to start letting some of the calls through and it's going to watch and make sure they're passing. And if they are passing, then it's going to reset the circuit breaker, go back to closed and try to return, re return the system to normal operation. If they keep failing, then it's going to return back to the open state and uh, and fail, start again fail fasting all of the calls. And so if we'd had this in this scenario, what would have happened is uh, immediately uh, as the load spiked, the circuit breaker would have tripped, all of the calls to synchronize the VS state would have failed, and the rest of the system would have kept running just fine. Um, we didn't have this, uh, so instead of a, a momentary blip, uh, we had several hours of downtime while we diagnosed the problem. Now, you still have, of course, your, your synchronization not working, so the circuit breaker tripping is a problem and someone needs to go investigate it, but you've significantly limited the impact um, while that's happened. So, like anything, nothing works unless it's tested. So, you know, you can go build all the circuit breakers you want, but I guarantee if you go put circuit breakers in, they don't work. Um, you have to go validate that they work. How do you do that? Well, one of the good ways to do that is fault inje injection testing. You actually simulate failures. You cause calls to fail. You disconnect network cables. You, um, uh, you cause calls to hang. You, you do various things uh, to make the system behave undesirably and then make sure that the, the system responds and, uh, and recovers and limits the impact. 
we do this uh, in, um, in our system, Visual Studio Team Services. One of the very nice things is we are a user of Visual Studio Team Services. And we have our own instance of it that we use. And, um, and we do all our fault injection testing on that account so that, of course, if you're injecting faults, you're injecting failures and someone's gonna see those failures. So we're the ones who see them rather than our, our customers. Um, simulate real life instances, randomly inject lots of different failures, and then monitor the circuit breakers to make sure um, that they are behaving the way we expect them to behave. So big lesson from that is, you know, if you're gonna do circuit breakers, you've gotta tune them in production, you've gotta verify that they happen. Another thing that's super important early on when, when we introduced circuit breakers, we learned that people would view the circuit breaker tripping as a problem in and of itself. Like, let's go figure out why the circuit breaker is tripping and let's fix it. Um, and, 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 and almost as if like it's a problem with the circuit breaker. But the thing you have to remember is the circuit breaker is your test. It's not the problem, it's the symptom. If a circuit breaker is tripping, something else is wrong. Go figure out why, what's causing the circuit breaker to trip don't focus on the circuit breaker itself. Um, and then the other sort of evolution we went through here is when we first put in circuit breakers, it was cool, to sit, they would trip and it was awesome, but then we didn't know why they were tripping. So we had to go do a bunch of instrumentation so that when a circuit breaker tripped, we would capture call stacks to figure out which part of the code was calling the circuit breaker. We kept capture exception information, capture performance information, all of this data so that when circuit breakers started tripping, uh, we were able to have the data necessary to go figure out what the underlying cause uh, of the tripping was. And then lastly, um, you got to monitor uh, circuit breakers regularly. They, they are uh, something you have to constantly be watching and everyone you have to root cause why. If a circuit breaker is tripping, something is wrong. It is not normal. It is not sort of status quo for circuit breakers to be tripping. If it's tripping, it's bad. Go fix it. Uh, circuit breakers only mitigate how bad uh, customer impact of a problem is. It doesn't eliminate how, uh, any customer impact. All right, uh, so that's sort of two things, feature flags and circuit breakers. Um, I wanna talk about the third thing that sort of comes into play uh, when you're thinking about um, operating at rapid cadence and managing the quality and, uh, and experience of your site. Um, deployment becomes an incredibly important uh, thing to think about um, and how you do deployment. There's good ways to do deployment and bad ways to do deployment. And our experience with that has, um, has evolved quite a lot. So if you go back to 2010, 2011 timeframe, you know, we deployed fairly infrequently. It was like every four or five, six months um, we were doing deployments. And over time, it gradually got faster and faster and faster to where we are now. We deploy, as I said, we deploy sprint payloads every three weeks. We deploy da daily hot fixes every day and we deploy um, uh, emergency hot fixes within an hour. I mean, it's just whenever we need to do a deployment, we can immediately do a deployment. Um, so that's, so we have, uh, uh, we have a fully automated, uh, release pipeline that we use Visual Studio Team Services for. Uh, Visual Studio Team Services is made up of 31 independent services, each with up to 15 instances. So do the math on that. That is hundreds of instances that we have to manage around the globe. There is no reasonable way to do that without a fully automated release pipeline. Um, that would be hundreds and hundreds of systems we were constantly having to deploy. And if you can imagine trying to deploy 500 systems you know, multiple times a day, your, your head would explode. Um, we have a, a, a high fidelity quality signal that helps us understand um, whether or not we're ready to deploy. Um, we have formalized safe deployment practices, which I'm gonna go into. If you're gonna be deploying hundreds of systems every day, you gotta think really hard because uh, you, you've sort of got a very automated way to deploy blog, bugs to lots and lots of systems. And you've got to think about how you're controlling the and, and, and testing the payloads that you're deploying. And then the cadence I've already spoken to. So we have a set of practices we call safe deployment practices. Um, they are designed to deploy changes incrementally to control risk. 
progressively rolling them out to larger and larger sets of customers. Automated health checks, we, we, we sort of use automated health checks um, to assess how things are going and we roll back if at any point there's a problem. Now you might say, hey, this sounds an awful lot like feature flags. Feature flags allows me to turn features on and off. Um, how's that different from safe deployment? Um, here's the way I think about it. The feature flags are awesome and they allow me to control exposure and they allow me to ship partially implemented code um, without sort of having to expose it to users. But when I deploy code with a feature flag in it, I'm still deploying code and any code could have a bug. I might have forgotten to put a feature flag around something, um, in which case uh, there's no amount of turning feature flags on or off that are gonna fix it. There can have a, you can have a bug anywhere for any reason and a feature flag may or may not help you mitigate the effects of a bug. Hopefully it does, but there's no guarantee. Safe deployment is the 100% hammer solution. You can be sure that there's no new bug been deployed to a system if you haven't deployed any code to it yet. Um, so safe deployment is about controlling where the actual bits get deployed to. And in fact, usually what happens is we'll roll the changes out across all of our systems. Then we go back and start turning on feature flags. So there are two mechanisms that play together, not, uh, not redundant mechanisms. Um, so in our system, we have five rings. What we call ring zero, ring one, ring two, ring three, and then, well, ring four and four A. I won't go into the details of why there's four and four A, but there are two sets of instances that deploy in parallel in ring four. Um, we have grand total, ooh, what is it? I think it's about, uh, did I have it on the last slide? Yeah, 15 instances divided up into these uh, into these five rings. The first ring, ring zero, is our instance. That's the instance that my team uses. So we always know that's what gets deployed first. Um, and after, after my team has validated it, then it'll go to ring one, then it'll go to ring two, and then to ring three, and I'll explain more about the semantics of those rings here in a minute. But this is literally a picture of our automated release pipeline. This is just a screenshot out of our web UI showing what our automated release pipeline looks like. So what are our deployment rings? There are, as I said, there are five of them. Ring zero um, is uh, internal only. People who have a very high tolerance for risk and bugs, which in this case means my team. Oh. Uh oh. All right, we recovered. We're recovered. All right, good. Um, so we deploy to ourselves first. Um, it doesn't matter what data center it's in. Um, ring one is um, is a small set of customers using a breadth of a product of the product, particularly in ways that we don't dog food, um, and they should be in the U.S. time zone so that our engineers are awake if there are problems. Uh, we don't want that being deployed at 3 a.m. because nobody's online to fix anything if it goes wrong. Um, and, it should be, uh, and it should be a very small customer set. Then in, in ring two, we sort of expand out to a, a sort of a medium to large uh, instance, again, in the U.S., uh, but a, a larger set of customers and a larger scaled instance. And then we go to very large and then gradually to everyone else. And the idea is that through each ring, you validate and you find issues. And I'd say every single sprint, every sprint without fail, we will find bugs in ring zero. Every deployment of, of a sprint payload, usually two or three, and we'll fix them. Um, and then we'll roll to ring one. And sometimes we'll find a bug there and we'll fix it. And then we'll roll to ring two. And this is just the way you do the deployment. So one of the key things is you allow bake time between each of the rings. We have five rings. Between each ring on a normal sprint payload, um, we wait 24 hours. So we deploy to ring zero and we'd wait 24 hours and wait and see uh, if we find any issues, if any of our users report problems. We watch telemetry, we watch alerts, 
Um, and then we roll to ring one. And then again, wait 24 hours, watch to see if there are any problems, then roll to ring two, wait 24 hours every time. So that's why like sometimes I, I, I blog about our deployments and I always have to say, these features will be showing up for you sometime in the next week or so. And the reason is because we wait 24 hours between each ring. We have five rings. Assuming nothing goes wrong, it takes us five days to get everything deployed. Um, and if something does go wrong, which as I say in the early rings, it almost always does, usually takes more than five days. Uh, so it might take six or seven days to get everything deployed. Um, for our daily deployments where the churn is much lower, their target ten, tend to be very targeted fixes, um, our, uh, our delay times are much shorter, usually an hour or two between rings to just validate that uh, we haven't done anything, anything catastrophic. Um, oh, and then one other lesson we learned here, uh, which was interesting, um, we were doing, I think it was our European data center, we were doing deployments late in the day in the US, and the problem was, uh, and I think this was ring, is it ring one? I think it was ring one, uh, maybe it was ring two, but anyway, it was our first European deployment. So we were doing them late in the day US, which was after hours Europe time. So Europeans would come in five hours before us. And if there was going to be an issue, it would be five hours before we woke up. So we started getting uh, wake up calls in the middle of the night of uh, service instability problems. and. Um, uh, we learned from that, particularly in the early rings, um, do the deployments during peak times. Uh, don't do them off hours because you never have a problem off hours when the load is low. You have your problems in on hours when the load is high. Um, so overall lessons learned, deploy often, uh, stay green. You got to ship quality at the end of the sprint, so you've got to keep your quality up throughout the whole sprint. Use consistent uh, and automated deployment uh, tooling across your dev test and prod. You can't have gaps. You can't have handoffs. If you're going to be doing deployments uh, daily, many times a day, it's got to be a complete automated pipeline from beginning to end that is consistent across dev test and production. Um, use an automated deployment tool to orchestrate and follow some safe development practice. They don't have to be exactly the same as the ones we use, but you've got to have some kind of way of controlling the impact of your changes. All right, so I've now covered three topics. I've got uh, two or three more I want to cover, but I wanted to just take a breath for a minute and see if anyone had any thoughts or questions on the first three topics that I've covered. Gone so that... Sorry, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? We're going to turn the room mic on so that people have the opportunity to ask questions. Awesome. Just a second. Can you turn on the? Is that mic on? Is it on now? I already unmuted it. <clears throat> oh, now I hear you. Okay. So. All right. Any any questions on uh, on what we've covered so far? All right, in the back first. So, do you guys find the problem back in one say like ring three or ring four? Then do you guys fix the problem and go back to ring zero with that update, or do you guys just let that process continue on from ring three and ring four? Um. Like, yeah. Closer yeah. the, the audio. I, I, I heard him good enough. Um, the answer is most of the time just continue from there because it's a very um, a, a very focused patch. We'll continue from there, although I will say that's burnt us a few times. So sometimes if it's um, if it's not like a blocking problem that we can't like the, the, the site is down and and users are, are, are suffering, 
what happens is it goes into the next daily deployment. So literally what, what payload we're deploying, I actually have a slide that depicts it, but I, I didn't include it in this deck. Um, the payload we're deploying throughout the sprint evolves throughout the sprint. So um, we will we'll, we'll, we'll develop a fix, we'll check it in, and then we'll do an accelerated daily deployment. As I said, the daily deployments, we only wait an hour or two between the rings rather than, um, rather than 24 hours. And what will happen is we'll roll it into the next daily deployment, start the daily deployment back at ring zero, and slide it through until it gets to you know, ring three or four, wherever the failure was, and then resume with that payload doing the 24-hour wait cycles on, uh, on the rings that haven't finished yet. So it depends just a little bit on how serious the problem is. If the site's down, we, we, you got to go faster than that. You have to just fix it immediately. But if it's not a site down problem, we roll it into the next daily and, and run it back through the rings. We have a remote question from Kyle Nunnery. Do you push hot fixes through faster than normal features? So yeah, the hot fixes, again, there's, there's sort of three classes of deployment. There's the sprint deployments, which take the 24 hour wait time. Then there's the daily deployments, which take the one to two hour uh, time, always start at ring zero, follow the same safe deployment practices. And then there's emergency fixes where again, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a scale unit in ring four that's down and nobody can access their code, I, I, can't, I can't wait days, I can't even wait hours. I've got to get that up immediately. And so those, we have an expedited process where you know, there's a little bit of a, if, the, if there's very little chance that you could possibly make it worse than it already is, then, then just go do it. Like it's, you, you can all, it can only get better. Um, but it's a judgment call. And, and, and you know, I've, I've seen enough times where people uh, decide to go fast and then in fact actually do end up making it worse than it was that, uh, that you got to be careful. But, but the mechanism exists and we do use it when, when we have serious site problems. So um, it probably makes sense to you, but um, not as much to me, just maybe I'm thinking in the wrong space, but early on you talked about flags and turning flags on and off. Yep. Are you setting those compile time environment variable or are they like via web pages or? Uh, they're, uh, they're actually rows in a SQL Server database uh, is where we store them. Um, and then we just have an API to, to go read them. We've got a, we've got a web service. Um, so there's a web service that sits on top of a SQL Server data space, data, database, and the, um, uh, the JavaScript client can just call that REST API to get the, to get the feature flag value and, uh, and then uh, operate based on that feature flag. And so you have those for all your different set of users that you want to control, obviously, I guess. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you, we actually organize our users into into stages. So we actually have we have rings for deployment. So uh, rings is the word we use to describe the order in which we deploy. We uh, we have another mechanism we call stages, which is the order in which we enable feature flags. And so there's a set of users who are internal, our our, our sort of internal testers. We call stage zero. There's our beta testers. We call stage one. And then there's stage two, which is everybody else. And, um, and so normally our normal pattern of turning feature flags on and off is, uh, is aligned with those stages. And then there's feature flags that we put some subset of our feature flags that we put under user control and they, and each user gets to decide whether it's on or off for them. And yeah, that SQL database then just has crap loads of rows for, you know, a value for each user who, who changes the default. Okay. Thanks for your answer. Sure. How do you decide um, what features ship and what features ship just straight out to the user to the various rings and what goes behind the feature flag? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so first, one of the important principles here is um, every, we really try to use a model of service ownership. So there's a, there's a team that owns every service and that team owns those decisions. There's like, you know, I, I, I want to be clear, like, I don't make those decisions, and, and my leadership team doesn't make those decisions. The service team makes those decisions. They own the service. They're accountable for it. They're responsible for it. They make those decisions. But we have guidelines. 
And the guidelines include um, any breaking, any user experience, any significant user experience change that would be considered disruptive to users, we want to put under feature flags and roll out uh, carefully. Um, any work that's going to span multiple sprints so that you're going to have half finished work checked in, we want feature flags for. Um, but, you know, small changes that are targeted, bug fixes, we don't feature flag everything because, yeah, you would end up with a, just an absolute, you know, spider web rat's nest of, of feature flags if you went too crazy. So it really is mostly larger features that take a longer period of time to develop and, uh, and, and, and maybe are uh, disruptive to the user experience. All right, we have another remote question from Gregory Hopper. Do you have these deployment guidelines or processes documented and publicly shared so that I can use it as a start of my own documentation? We do, and in fact, I will, um, I'll give you some URLs at the end with, uh, with some content that you can use to, there's some videos and, and some, uh, some, uh, some documents that, that you'll be able to use. Uh, your, your third bullet point where it says use consistent deployment tooling and dev test and prod. Yep. Does that mean if you're using VSCS, use it for dev test and prod? Yeah, it, it, like you don't have to use VSTS, but, but you know, I, I, let me say it this way. In here's the, the, the main point I'm trying to make with it. In, if, if you go back 10, 15 years, sort of pre-DevOps, then the way the world worked is engineers would write code. They would write their own little hacked up deployment scripts to test what they were doing. Um, and then at some point they'd hand it over to the ops team and the ops team would then go build the production deployment scripts. And the problem is that that handoff is a very lossy handoff. And it also means that the engineers, like when there are problems, the engineers don't understand how it's deployed in the production environment. They don't understand what they need to go fix. Um, and it just creates this barrier between the two. Um, really one of the fundamental things that we did, uh, and we've gone to a pretty far extreme, which I'll talk about, is, uh, is, is make it very consistent. We use one set of deployment scripts. You use those scripts in your dev environment, you use them in your test environment, and you use them in production. And in fact, we've gone so far as to take the, the, what you might historically call the ops team, we call the service engineering team, completely out of the deployment loop. Uh, we, don't, we don't have the ops team involved in deployments at all. The service team owns deployments. Um, they decide when it's time to deploy. They, under, they, they decide, you know, they write the scripts, they manage it. The only, thing the, the only role the ops teams play is they're in the approval process. So they, they do get notifications of deployments and they, get, uh, they have an approval um, option. But the service team is in control of deployment. Sorry, so the second part of that question. So your diagram showed your various rings. I'm assuming that's just for production. <coughs> yes, it is. There's, there's a couple rings before that which are like our test and pre-production environments. Those are just our production rings. So it's a good observation. Thanks. Now that said, all of our all of our environments, even our test and pre-production, are are in production. We treat them like production environments. They they're they're managed the same way our production environments are managed. But but they don't have any external costs. They don't have any they don't have any real customers on them. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward. I got a couple more topics that I want to cover, and uh, let's see how much progress we can make. All right, so let's talk about live site. So another big cultural change you have to make when you sort of adopt this process is thinking hard about live site. Live site is really about ensuring that um, that the system is up and running at all times, and that customers are having a decent experience. Um, and one of the, there are a whole bunch of things that that brings into play. Um, one of them is telemetry. Um, you now need tons of telemetry. For my service, we collect about seven, tele, seven terabytes of telemetry a day on VSTS. And it's data about everything that's happening in the system. So if at any point we get an alert, we hear a complaint, um, we see a problem, we have got the data to go figure out what caused it. Um, I also want to talk a bit about um, 
the user experience and, and SLAs and how do you define good enough. I, this is a, a topic I've railed against for a long time, and I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the journey we've gone through. I think we started where everybody starts with outside in synthetic tests. You create some pingdom or you know whatever ping just periodically to hit the service and ask, you know, is everything okay? And then the service responds yes or no. And that'll find certain things. It'll find, you know, if the network's down, if the service is completely unavailable. But it really tells you almost nothing about individual customers. And individual customers can be having very bad experiences. Um, but the ping is fine um, because that, that call, the service is behaving fine on. Um, it doesn't hit the database that's having problems. It doesn't do something. Um, it's, in, in my view, it is a horrible, horrible way to measure the quality of service that you're providing. So the next evolution is real user monitoring. Great. So if we're not going to create synthetic load, we're going to actually measure what real users are doing. And our first evolution of that was uh, what we called command health. Basically, uh, monitor every single request that comes into the system and, and look at, did it have an error? And was it fast enough? And create kind of a performance SLA for every request. And, um, and any request that was slow or failed gets counted as a failure. And then we just created a very simple metric, which was um, the percentage of unhealthy requests. And it turned out um, that was better, but, uh, but it, was the, it, it created some phenomenon which were not not good. In fact, if you look at the little diagram below, the gray line with the phase two model pointing at it, what it says is we were always really good. We were like 99.9% .9 availability all the time. And yet we still heard users complaining about the reliability of the system. We're like, well, I don't understand. Like we're, we're measuring every request, like almost all the requests are going through, like everything looks good. What's the problem? Well, as we sort of teased that apart and tried to understand, we realized, oh, well, there's a couple things that happen. First of all, like I might do 20 things and have one of them fail in a, you know, in a, in a five minute time period. And I'm unhappy because like something I tried to do didn't work. And, um, and even though, you know, it was a relatively small percentage of them, um, I, I'm still not happy. Secondly, um, I could do a whole bunch of stuff, and if all the requests are succeeding, I'm requesting, you know, hitting request, 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 and as soon as they start failing, I go to lunch. So by definition, the number of failed requests is dramatically reduced because when the thing starts failing and I realize I'm not going to be able to get my work done, I stop trying. And so there's this period of time in which the system's actually not working, but I'm not actually seeing a lot of failed requests. Um, and so that yielded this, this sort of artificially rosy looking model. So we evolved again um, to an to a evolution that we still measure requests. We still look at slow and failed requests. But this time, instead of just measuring um, the number of requests, we, we look at, we bucket those requests by user, and we say if any request, if, if any user, has any requests in a one minute window that fails, then we mark the service as unhealthy for that whole one minute window. Still not perfect, but it basically says, let's, let's think more broadly about it from a user's perspective instead of numerically the requests. And then you divide that by like how many users are using the system. So if I've got you know five users who had a problem in this minute and let's say five users who had no problem, then that's 50% availability because 50% of your users had a problem in that minute. And now I can sort of aggregate that. And we took that same data, and now you can see our phase three model and see what that showed our availability. And where we were showing 99.9% .9 availability with the command count model, suddenly we were showing like 88% availability with this model. And that was way more reflective of the kind of complaints we were getting from our customers who were complaining about experiences. And they matched up, you know, where we saw the big dips were the, 
periods in which they were complaining. So it, 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 it matched the data to the intuition. And now this is the model um, that we use. Uh, and we found it to be a very effective model. And we've, we've now really internalized that model. We do alerting on that model. So anytime we see our availability in terms of this notion of user experience dips, um, uh, we, we throw an alert and we go figure out, uh, you know, what's going on. Um, so that's this point is we, we literally have the, we have them, uh, uh, customer impact analysis is what we call it. It's customer impact analysis alert. And, um, and anytime that goes above some threshold, uh, we fire alerts and we go start creating a live site incident and investigating, you know, what's happening. Um, so another part of the live site culture is incidents themselves. Um, you develop a rigor around them about really understanding what's happening. Anytime we have an incident, we create a conference bridge. Uh, we get engineers on the call to start diagnosing the problem. We have this thing called DRI, Designated Responsible Individual. It's basically an engineer who's on call. Um, we start dealing with communication, both internally and externally, posting to our customers what's happening. Yes, we know there's a problem. We're looking at it and start pulling in all the people internally to work on it. Um, depending upon the severity of the problem, you do more or less fan out on investigations. If it's a very serious problem, we'll usually have three or four different teams pursuing different theories on what could be the cause of it. and culling as we as we start to realize oh that doesn't look uh like a promising uh cause then we'll call that one and uh and maybe look at the next one um gather lots of data for root cause figure out how to mitigate record everything you've done um you know one of the things we learned uh relatively early on is sometimes lsis can run a long time and they start at three o'clock in the morning and they're still going at 10 a.m the next day the people who were working on them at three o'clock in the morning are tired and they're not at their best. Um, so you have to start thinking about, uh, about how, to, how to rotate people through LSIs. In fact, we have, well, actually, when, when LSIs start during, a, if we have a very serious LSI that starts during work hours, we'll sometimes send people home at like three o'clock in the afternoon to go sleep so that we know that the people who've been in since seven o'clock in the morning will will be done, be tired by seven or eight or nine o'clock at night, um, and we'll have somebody who's fresh who can come back in uh, and always be on top of it. So these are just things you have to think about when you're running a mission critical service. Um, you know, we document everything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to highlight all of it. But some very important KPIs, uh, time to detect, how long did it take us to discover that there was a problem, time to engage once we knew there was a problem, how long did it take us to get an engineer on the call and start looking at it, time to mitigate, um, how long did it take us um, to, to make it such that the problem wasn't affecting customers anymore, total impact. Uh, we have a detailed timeline that shows all of the stuff that's happened. Um, out of every LSI uh, comes a root cause analysis with a detailed set of repair items um, that are the things that need to get fixed so that this kind of thing never happens again. And those things go on to an engineering scorecard um, that, uh, that we use to track the repair items that every engineering team has. And, um, uh, and you're expected to fix uh, to resolve all of your repair items within two sprints. Uh, and our scorecard tracks the number of repair items that you have that are over two sprints old. And there's visibility and pressure on, on getting those fixed. Um, so then those are sort of the, the action, or sort of the learnings. Um, and so I had one more section, which I'm not going to get to because I want to be respectful. We're at the hour. Uh, I want to stop for a minute, see if there are any questions, and then we'll wrap up. You guys still there? Yep. yep. Thanks, right. Brian. We're working on the microphone. All right. Appreciate Any more it. questions? Yep. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, take, we'll, we'll, we'll take one question, and then we have to uh, we have to surrender the room. All right. And so we have actually a uh, remote question. 
Okay. And it is from Mike Sigsworth. Was all of the feature toggle and circuit breaker code written internally, or are there third party packages and tools available that you've leveraged? And if internally written, are there any plans to make it publicly available? There, there are third party packages for all of it. Um, the, the, um, the feature flag stuff, we, we wrote it all internally. I, I'll be clear about that. Mostly timing wise, we wrote it before a lot of the commercial ones became available. Um, the one for feature flags that we generally recommend is something called Launch Darkly. Um, they've got a pretty good solution. I think if we were starting today, that's probably what we'd use. Um, for, um, uh, for circuit breakers, I don't know of any commercial solution because they tend to be fairly custom. Um, Netflix open sourced their uh, circuit breaker implementation and we started with that. So we took that open source code. It evolved a lot. Um, so it doesn't look much like the Netflix code anymore. Um, but it is where we started. Um, I, you know, are we going to ever externalize those things and, and make them available to customers? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, we, we toy with the idea occasionally, but, um, but we don't have any commitment to do so yet. All right. All right. So I want to thank you guys a lot. I really appreciate you guys having me, and I hope uh, hope this conversation was useful for you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, this has been a tremendous presentation, and we thank everyone watching on the live stream. We've had a thank you. We've had a, a very uh, quick uptick in user group attendance from our first meeting last month to this month. Um, and not only meetup group, uh, people who've joined the meetup group, but people who've registered to attend the meetup and people uh, coming here in the Austin, Austin headquarters of the, the new Microsoft DevOps user group, but also uh, watching remotely. And we'll record this. Uh, we have recorded this and we'll make it available online. And so uh, if this has been useful to anyone watching, please uh, put the word out and we'll continue to grow the group both, uh, both locally and remote. And if anyone listening remotely would like to organize and host a, a uh, live streaming location where you um, or orchestrate a group setting where you all attend remotely together, then please get in contact via the meetup group and we'll grow the Microsoft DevOps community together. Thank you very much. Have and, a great and I, day. I, I promised an Earl to that you could go find more, and there it is right there, aka.ms slash learn DevOps. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again, Brian. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.